Hello, my name is Delvin Molden, producer and creator of the original OGs. This week, we decided to rerun one of our more popular shows, Big Daddy Kane. You know, after we aired Daddy Kane, a lot of my friends, family, and people reached out to me and said, hey man, how did you guys get Daddy Kane to be on your show? Well, there's a story behind this. One day, Mr. Rick called me and said, hey brother, I just spoke to Daddy Kane. He said he's gonna be on the show. Now I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right, we'll see. About three months later, I get a call and text from Daddy Kane. We set the date and the rest is history. When we finished shooting, I approached Mr. Rick to say, hey brother, why did Daddy Kane agree to be on our show? Mr. Rick just shrugged and said, the brother just want to help. So you have to understand, both Mr. Rick and I have a lot of celebrity friends that we've reached out to. Kane took time out of his busy schedule. We're talking about one of the icon in the hip hop community. Flew to Chicago, appeared on the show, flew back to New York. All I can say is when I met the brother on the set, this brother is one of the most humble brothers, tons of integrity. But most of all, I felt his strength as a leader. So once again, please like, subscribe, and don't forget to share. But next week, we have a very exciting show, Benny Lee. After Benny Lee, we have one of the most exclusive shows in the first time for the original OG platform. We have a part one and a part two series. So stay tuned, very excited. Once again, we created this platform to give voice to the voiceless. If you know of an OG, or if you know someone with a unique story that needs to appear on this platform, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you. Enjoy the reshowing of Big Daddy Kane. Patty LaBelle? How did that work? I got a call from Benny Medina, who was running Warner Brothers at the time. He said, I just got a call from Patti LaBelle about you. She said that her son um, wants you to sign, autograph a poster for him. I came by his office, autographed the poster, and told him, do me a favor, tell Patti. I said, don't be scaring me like that, because I, I thought she was ready to do a song with me or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Next day, Benny Medina called Bam. and said, Patti want to do a song. Wow. There can only be one, the original. OG, two letters that define respect. Welcome to the original OGs. I created the original OGs to document the forgotten parts of American history. I want to recognize and give a voice to the men and women that have climbed to the top of their game. Believe me, the men and women that sit in front of this marquee have been authenticated as original OGs. My name is Mr. Rick. Welcome to my world, a world of the originals, the unique. Welcome to the original OGs. Welcome to the original OGs, and I'm your host, OG Mr. Rick. This is the show where we travel back in time, revisiting American history. And there can be no American history unless there's black history. We're going to go back today with someone who's an icon and a legend in American history. His name is Antonio Hardy. We know him as Big Daddy King. He's a rapper, a producer, and an actor. His career started in 1986, member of the Juice Crew. He is widely regarded as one of the most influential people in hip hop. Rolling Stone ranked his song, Ain't No Half Steppin' at number 25 of 50 of the top hip hop songs. How you doing, my brother? Man, I wanna thank you for coming on the show, brother. Nah, man, I'm gonna be here with you. Hey, man, we've been kicking it for a while. Uh -huh. uh, can you explain for me what is hip hop? I think that um, hip hop is 
a form of ghetto expression that combines DJing, MCing, graffiti, and breakdancing. You've had rap coming from people like Pygmy Markham back in 1968. Right. You've had rap coming from people like DJ Hollywood in the clubs in New York since right. 1971. You've had DJs, mm -hmm. um, not just in New York, Chicago, LA, and everywhere else that played parties. Correct. But um, in 73, a brother by the name of Cool Herc, what he did was combined all these elements because at the time when there was rap in clubs, there were younger artists that couldn't do it. Okay. Because they weren't paid to DJ at the party. So right. they couldn't get on the mic at these parties and rock. <laughs> right. The break dancers couldn't dance because when they get on the floor and start kicking people in the shin, security kicked them out. Cool Hurt created an environment where people could come and rap, break dance, artists could draw wow. and all this. And he, he was the one DJing, but it opened the doors for so many others. For those different elements. You know, like Grandmaster Flash, um, Grand Wizard Theodore, and many more wow. to come. You know, but yeah, it was by combining all of those elements and creating, as I said, a ghetto expression for the young cats in the hood to really like um, express themselves. My introduction to a portion of hip hop that was the last poets. How does that work? Being um, a conscious person, I'm a big fan of the last poets. Correct. And on um, the material. Yes, sir. Um, on the other side, me being an MC, last poets to me are more spoken word. Okay. Um, over music. Right. I think what Pig McMahon was doing um, is more kind of similar to what we um, embraced as MC. Okay. Like it was like first done by DJ Hollywood in okay. 1971. Like he was the first one to rhyme over a break beat. Okay. And that's true hip hop fashion. Wow. Because the last poets picked me Marham there in the studio to a live recording. Right. Hip hop is, you know, an MC rhyming over a break beat. Okay. The first person to do that was um DJ Hollywood. Break beat is like the break part on the record. Like you hear good time from the <laughs> Right. You know, they're singing, you know. Right. And then when that part comes, good times, and then right. break down the boom, 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 yeah. Boom, boom, so boom. That's what that's they're, a break. Okay, yeah. they're looping that? Yeah, the DJ, you know, would bring that part back, just keep bringing that part back right. for the you know, people to dance to, because that was the groove, and that would be what the MC would rap to and the B-boy would break to. Okay, so for you older uh, ladies and gentlemen like myself, I think we have some clarity now. So <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I was totally confused, man. <laughs> you know, and, and I knew that I would get an in-depth answer from you. So I remember one time you and I, we were in a limousine and we were doing something and this brother was trying to demonstrate to you his rap skills. And I kind of interrupted because I really didn't get it. And you said, hold on, Mr. Rick. And it, it was very uh, respectful. You know, you said, hold on for a minute. But the way you said it communicated to me like, hey, man, this is business, man. Hold on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And at that point, I said that to say I understood at that point how dear rap was to you. Well, you know, I'm someone that, you know, um, tried for a very long time. I started rapping in 82. I right. didn't get a deal until 87. Right. So when you meet someone young that's aspiring and they're trying to get acknowledged, right. you know, just get some sort of recognition, you know, I like to try to at least give them that just for confidence reasons. Exactly. So that they can keep striving, you know, keep, you know, you know, trying to, you I know, achieve it. their goal. Well, it communicated with me. I never did that again. <laughs> I'm talking about, hey, man, I never interrupted you again. I had a certain level of respect for your craft. It communicated to me. You know, I, I, I seen where you were at with that. You know, I, I didn't feel broken or anything. I just I understood where you were coming from and how 
much that meant to you, you know, and it's been years later and you still have the same passion for it. Your parents, I believe, and this is something I read, correct me if I'm wrong, your father was from North Carolina or South? South Carolina. South Carolina. See, I knew I would mess that up. And your mother was from New York? Brooklyn, yeah. What kind of history did your father give you about his upbringing in South Carolina and your mother in Brooklyn? Because that's 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 two different state of minds. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Two different state of mind. Like my mother, she would tell me about stuff that she used to get into and um, you know things that would happen to her in junior high school, high school, um, her girlfriends that she hung out with. Like she, we would have those type of conversations. Mm-hmm. My father would never talk about nothing like like that. Everything was, you know, always a real short answer. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you right to the point. He hey. not, yeah, he's not telling you. He's not giving up too, information, too much information. I, I get it. I yeah. get it. So how did it mold your thinking as a young man? Yeah, I mean, with my father, you know, it was the type of thing where I, I knew how he ended up in New York mm-hmm. and why he had to leave South Carolina. I you know, get it. You know, because of one of those situations. But he didn't tell me. Right. <laughs> but know, see. Another family member told that's me. That's what know. I'm saying because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how my family ended up in Chicago and the other half ended up in New York for those same reasons. My uncle, gotcha. had, they had to get him out of town because of what he had done. Yeah. You know, so. And for the money in the record, my father didn't do nothing but um, take money that was owed to him. I get it. Your parents get to New York. They have you. You began to grow up in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Coming up in Brooklyn. What was that atmosphere like? I mean, well, Brooklyn, you know, where I was at in a best style, that's 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 the hood. You was around that type of environment. However, you know, the kids are outside. Right. You know, so, you know, you come out with, you know, your, your, your big wheel and you know, you <laughs> ride nine the block and let you know your friend ride up the block, and y'all just taking turns. Right. And girls are um, on the sidewalk, you know, jumping double dutch and things of that nature, and you know, you eating candy and you know that just normal a, childhood. Yeah, yeah, normal, yeah, normal childhood. But at the same time, you know, you in the hood, and you you know that, that there's certain places that you shouldn't go. Right. And it's not safe to go. And certain people, when you see them, you know, you know, you, you might want to go back inside the house. Exactly. You know, that type of thing. Yeah, you read that climate. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood not far from here. It was a beautiful neighborhood, man. But then when the 70s came, the dynamics changed and it got real ugly, very crime ridden. Uh, the drugs started coming in, uh, the different aspects of negativity put it like that. Did that happen in, in Brooklyn? Or as far as you can remember, it was always just a rough territory? I grew up, you know, um, in, the, in, in the 70s. And my teenage years was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, so with me, um, I guess I caught the tail end of the heroin era and the beginning of the crack era. Yeah. You know, so that's what I saw. You know, I saw... Uh, uh, a lot of um, adults that um, had heroin addictions and, you know, the way they would act and mellow out and, you know, do a lot of weird stuff. And then, you know, understand, I'm like, you know, seven, eight years old right. seeing this. And then I become a teenager and now I'm seeing people up and down the street late at night, you know, <laughs> trying to steal stuff, asking you for anything, trying to sell you anything, you know, when the crack era came in. We got to Harlem. Hey, man, when you're talking about a drug epidemic, I've never seen nothing like that in my life. Scared me so bad, it was insane. 13, 14 year olds strung out on drug, laid over in the corners. So, uh, two or three of them still had syringes in their arms, man. This was insane. I mean, like to see someone come on the block and see three or four people leave to go in the building with, 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 with this person. You know what they're going to do. Right. You see them 
with the door open, music playing, and everybody just sitting there mellowed. Like you could have just walked in there, stole a stereo. They wouldn't even <laughs> know. They wouldn't, known. Even, they wouldn't even know. Now it's the type of thing where there's this new drug out. Everybody's experimenting with it. And you're seeing the effects. And the effects are completely different. Nobody's mellowed out. No. Nobody's hyperactive, eyes bulging out. The, over. Um, out late hours of the night trying to sell you um, anything, wow. any and everything. You know, it, it was just crazy. It was, yeah. This is a developmental stage in your life and you're headed toward hip hop. When we started talking about the heroin epidemic, the crack epidemic, that shaped your community as well as it did mine, I'm sure. And it allowed you to be able to write a different reality. Is, is, is that a good way of saying it? Yeah, but I mean, you know, you gotta understand too, like, you know, there was black cinema of the 70s. Mm -hmm. So to see movies like Three the Hard Way, right. Gordon's War, Brotherhood of Death, and like so many others. Right. And then also the Fly Guys, you know, like Superfly. Right. You know, this is the, the, the dude. But the he wanted dude. to get out of the game. <laughs> right, the dude. He wanted to get out of the game. Right. And then, like, you had the Mac and Willie Dynamite. These were the dudes, but you saw the effect when they stayed in the game too long. Exactly. So just understanding those movies, you know, you, you, you I kind of understood where I didn't want to go, what the road I didn't exactly. want to take. Exactly. Exactly. You know? But, but I definitely wanted to dress like them, though. Oh, hey, we still do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey, yeah, I'm still yeah. doing all of that. I can remember, you know, uh, we were in a different era, and uh, we kind of carried that swag real strong because, for me, I still admire that art form, you know, the, that style, that fashion. Oh, man, I'm, I'm still with that today, man. You know, that's the, that, that was something that, was very unique in life, man. Understood. You know, so I, I get that. When did hip hop affect your life? I think hip hop affected my life in 77. You know, I'm used to being outside playing, you know, mm -hmm. playing Coco Livio or uh, Red Light, Green Light, and having fun with the other kids. But the first time my cousin took me to a block party, I saw a DJ by the name of Master D cutting up um, Love is the Message. I saw how everybody crowded around to watch him. It's like he'd been <laughs> playing records the whole time. Right. He threw this particular song on, everybody crowded around to watch him. And then a mic line form, and then you seen cats, you know, getting on the mic, rhyming one after the other. And I was like, oh yeah, this is something else. Wow. You know, and it, it fascinated me to the point that I wanted to get into it. I thought that I wanted to be a DJ, you know, like him, you know. It, it opened up a certain thing inside of you. I never understood the depth of your journey. When I first met you, I knew who you were and I, I, I admired who you were and I really liked your craft. But once I met you as a person, I liked you as a person, you know, I just, hey man, this is, I, I, I can see eye to eye with this guy. That blinded me from really knowing what it is and in what depth that you do what you do. I like hanging with you. Okay. Because you're not around me because I'm Big Daddy Kane. Right. Because you don't even know what the hell I do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. When I really started digging into what it is that you do and what you have done, I was mind blown, brother. I, I walked away saying, this brother is hip hop. No disrespect to anybody else, but I'm just saying, you put so much work into this and you know, you, you, you've kept this thing alive on your part. Appreciate you. You begin to talk about Biz Marquis. I, I really did like that brother's style of doing things. You know, and then you started talking about Tupac and Jay-Z and Biggie, and I'm like, God damn. You know, and these were people that were, they were looking up to you, man. Biz Marquis was another situation, but these other guys, they were looking at you. Well, Biz, you know, he was the one that brought me into the game. Um, we met back in 84, and wow. he told me that 
that I should get down with him because right. he'd be doing a lot of shows. And he promised that he'd one day get me a record deal. As soon as he got a record deal, he took me on the road with him and asked me to help him write his first album. And right after that, he got me a record deal. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for Biz, believe it <laughs> in me. How did Jay-Z come in, p into play? Jay-Z came in, this is, uh, I can't remember, 88, 89, somewhere around here. I did a mixtape with mm -hmm. an artist that Jay-Z used to run with named Jazz O. Okay. And Jazz asked, can his man rhyme on the tape? Right. I said, fine. So we did the tape and afterwards on the ride home, one of the cats said to me, well, we really wanted you to work with Jazz O. Right. We're trying to get him a new deal. Right. And I told them, like, I kind of like the light skin dude better. Can I work with him? Right. And that was that's Jay -Z. how me and Jay-Z ended up connecting. So, um, you know, I was taking him in the studio and stuff like that. When I went on tour with Patti LaBelle, I noticed that she was doing outfit changes. Like, and I'm like, oh, nobody in hip hop does this. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, let me so, get that game. <laughs> yeah. So when I left off the road with Patty and took my tour back out, called Jay Z, and I called another rap brother by the name of Positive K. Wow. He had a song called I Got a Man. He didn't have it out then. Right. But um, I had them, and I would bring them out, let them rhyme on stage in between my show while I would do an outfit change. Wow. So at that point, I had Jay and Paz on the, on the road with me. Patty LaBelle? How did that work? How, how, I mean, how, how does that fit? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got a call from Benny Medina, who was running Warner Brothers at the time. He said, I just got a call from Patti LaBelle about you. She said that her son um, wants you to sign, autograph a poster for him. I came by his office, autographed the poster, and told him, do me a favor, tell Patty, I said, don't be scaring me like that because I, th I thought she was ready to do a song with me or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Next day, Benny Medina called Bam. and said, Patty want to do a song. And I mean, I came, because um, I came uh, to the studio she recorded at in Philly. And I, I, when we got there, Patty came through and brought some fried fish and vegetarian collard greens, mac and cheese. Wow. And, yeah, laid the whole spread out. Yeah, man, it was, man, it was amazing. That's, yeah. that's crazy. I, I, I can just only imagine how you felt about that. That had to be like, whoa, Patty LaBelle and yeah, I. Yeah, no, I was blown away, man. <laughs> I can get it, man. So how, how does it transition into Biggie and Tupac? This show has the intent to define what a real OG is, what an original OG is. My partner and I have developed a method to ensure that if someone should sit in front of this OG logo, that they have been authenticated and found to be true in their history as far as what an OG is. We were having a conversation about your relationship with Biggie Smalls. With Biggie, it wasn't the type of thing where like um, I put him on or did anything for him. Mm -hmm. Like really, that was my DJ, Mr. C, okay. that um, put Biggie on. Oh, wow. Now, um, according to C, according to Biggie, according to Little C's and other people, they say that he patterned his style after me. This is not me talking. This is what you know they have said. But um, I've always thought that Biggie was a an amazing artist, mm -hmm. MC, and had a bright future. I wish he, you know, wow, could have lived to do more. Exactly. Um, but um, I never was really hands on with Biggie's career. Okay. Pac, on the other hand, Pac used to dance for Digital Underground. Right. So when I took Digital Underground on my first tour, oh, that's okay. how I met Tupac as one of their dancers. Right. I remember and that. Um, he used to hang with my dancers, Scoob and Scrap. Oh, okay. And then he would come to me and tell me that he's working on his own solo stuff. And he'd kick rhymes for me, and we'd hang, we'd talk, and, you know, just chop it up. He was one of the brothers that I would, you know, try to give game to because right. I felt that not only was he talented, I, I felt that he had a deep passion. Right. Like, you could see that Pac had a, a very deep passion wow. for his craft. And... When he came out as an artist, it showed. So you can say you saw Pac coming. Absolutely, by all means. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Your body of work and your relationships in hip hop is unbelievable. I mean, you've touched hip hop in so many ways and so many artists. 
that it's it's insane, man. You know, was there a point in your career where things, I would like to use the word, slowed down? Absolutely. I mean, as with any artist, you know, there's a point in, you know, where your career slows down. Matter of fact, I could even say it with, with mine, you know, and specifically, I can say with mine, there was a point where it came to a complete halt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, this music industry, you know, is a roller coaster ride. I get it. And I mean, that's something that um, if you're going to get into it, you need to understand. You need to know that. That's it's, what I'm talking about. It's a roller about. coaster ride. You know, yeah. you got to understand that, you know, you're going to have your ups and you're also going to have your downs. You know, you just got to know how to ride the wave. You know? So how did you survive that? and get things back to moving? I think that I survived it due to the uniqueness of my music mm -hmm. and what Big Daddy Kane as an artist meant. Right. I came out during a time period where hip hop had so many unique songs mm -hmm. that had a lot of um, integrity and originality that they had stay power. I get it. So even though there were new artists coming out, you know, constantly, these songs stood the test of time. Right. And a time period came where I want to see Kane again. I want to <laughs> see Dougie Fresh again. Right. I want to see MC Light again. The video, I get the job done. That that beat, that that charisma, that unique thing that I saw attracted me to what you were doing in rap. That 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 held my attention. I was not rap fan because I'd come in an era of old school and I'm still stuck there today. You know, I'm dramatics and delphonics and I'm still stuck with that shit and I know you love it too. But <laughs> Certain things, certain people, certain songs in rap did it for me. The name Big Daddy <laughs> killed the fucking game, man. <laughs> nah, I don't think that it was. Uh, I think that it was just um, something that a lot of people thought and didn't say. It's the type of thing where, you know, there's a little big daddy in everybody, but since I'm him, there's a little bit more in me. You, you see know? what I'm saying? <laughs> so what made you, what caused you to be attracted to the name Big Daddy? You know, it's the funniest thing in the world. I actually heard it on one of those old beach party movies from Frankie <laughs> Avalon and Annette Foucault. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's where I first heard it. Wow. Yeah, and started using it from there. I did not know that Kane was an acronym for... King Asiatic, Nobody's Equal. Bam. I, I think a lot of people can appreciate hearing that. What made you create that acronym? In all honesty, it was like uh, my 5% of name, King Asiatic. And when I was writing the rhymes to a song... It just came to me. The name Cain is superior to many people. It means King Asiatic, nobody's equal. And once I said it, it just stuck and everybody started, you know, I using it. I get it. How were you introduced to the knowledge of the five percenters? Back in junior high school, there was a god body by the name of Divine that I used to hang with. Like, uh, me and a couple of my friends, we would, you know, cut school to go to 42nd Street to go see the Kung Fu flicks. <laughs> right. And um, his brother Divine, you know, he was a five percenter and he was dropping jewels one day and I found it very interesting and I wow. you know, told him that I wanted to learn. You know, um, he gave me some lessons. You know, I started studying. But I don't think I was taking it too serious. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. taking it too serious, you know. Um, to, you know, you know, a few years later, and then okay. I started really getting deep into it. Right. You no. Know? The, the founder of that was who? Clarence X? Yeah, Clarence 13X. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I do know some history of it, uh, not in depth, but 
that was, was that the beginning of your next level of consciousness? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, it was like the stuff that I was learning, I felt like, um, this is positive stuff that the youth need to know that right. other people need to hear. Right. That I felt like, no, but it, that my people need to hear. Right. My people need to understand. I get it. You know, I think I'm like how to appreciate and love yourself and know your value. You know, I, I felt like I learned a lot of that, you know, you know, through the five percent nation. And, and, and I wanted to share that with others. And that you put in your songs in certain ways, that Absolutely. consciousness. Yeah. Because your songs have always pretty much been compared to hip hop, compared to rap, clean. Yeah, to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you got your songs, but I'm saying overall, you know, uh, you expressed yourself, but you you didn't get grimy with it. No, I wasn't. I was never really like you know the raunchy right. type or the gangster exactly. rapper. That was never my thing. You right. know, I I use some profanity from time to time. Oh yeah, but that's that's probably the center of it. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying, yeah. and that concept of five percenters it 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 delivers in your music it delivers in your character you know i i grew up in that way and i i'm i'm really heavy into esoteric science so as a younger man and and knowing you and looking at you i i could see where that consciousness was and i knew it was a foundation for it once you encounter a certain knowledge you think a certain way and it really gave me a spiritual closeness. That, that, that's what I'm trying to say. I, I, a meeting of the minds, you know. Oh, and, no, uh, no, I think that's beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that there was a connection there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, and, and a few months back, Ghost and I were talking. He just happened to say, oh, man, yeah, uh, I was talking to Kane the other day, and we were, and I was like, you, you did what? He's like, no, I was talking to Ken. I said, man, you know how bad I'm trying to get in touch with that brother? He said, well, oh, man, you know, I, I make it happen for you because Ghost met you through me. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's my man. He was like, oh, no, man, I take care of that. I'm like, man, I've been trying to get in touch with this brother for two years, man. I want him to come on the show. That's the way the universe made that happen, man. You yeah, know? Yeah. And, uh, and Ghost's a good guy, man. That's my man. Yeah. Shout out to Ghost. Without a doubt, brother, as long as I've known you, You've been a gentleman. Yeah. How do you see OG through your eyes? Through my eyes? Yes, sir. You treat people the way you want to be treated. Thank you very much. If I treat you with respect, then you should treat me with respect. Likewise. And I feel that everybody is, you know, created equal, regardless of the bank account. So I try to treat people the same way I want to be treated because it's like, you can be right here <laughs> treating someone less. You never know 10 years down wow. the line, the Flip. positions can change. <laughs> Flip. <laughs> and you, know, you may need that person help. And exactly. you dumped on them when you was there. So I try to treat people equal, you right. know? Because I mean, I believe that each and everybody, I'm not nobody special. I think we all have a special gift. It's just a matter of Japanese. you sticking with it, trying to find out what it is. Correct. You know, and see it through. Man, you've been in the game how long? Uh, I think 36 years. You definitely got to harness those tools, man. You cannot lose your vision. You got to stay the course, man. You don't achieve greatness <laughs> by, you know, um, luckily, you know, land in a position. But hello. You know, I think that greatness comes from the struggles that you go through, the trials and trials that wow. you go through yes, to sir. maintain it. Yes, sir. You know, you may lose, you know, some battles. You take some losses, you know, um, may lose some money, whatever. It's what you go through to, to, to maintain it. You to know? make your To character. stay there. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I mean... Yeah, it's like, you know, that struggle is the thing that makes you. It's the important thing, you know, yeah. because without that struggle, I, I really don't think we can get it. You know? I think that that's one of 
the dangerous things that where you see so many suicides um, today in a younger generation. Yes. Because of so many people that um, became overnight success or uh, influencers, mm -hmm. rappers, whatever the case may be. And that fame starts to fade. And wow. it's like they don't know what to do because they never really witnessed the struggle to achieve it. Right. You know, and they don't understand, you know, like how you have to really stay locked and you know, you know, dead on it like yeah, that. Yeah, stay know? the course. Stay the course because you're gonna be tried. You're go you're gonna be tested. I'm telling you, and and it's for you to overcome whatever that situation is. Mm -hmm. They're gonna come, and you can overcome them. You know, if there's a small setback, keep pushing because when you overcome it, it's only gonna make you a better person. When they were going to or they started talking about celebrating 50 years of hip hop. How did you feel about that? I think one of the main things that, um, I, that made me happy about 50 years of hip hop mm -hmm. was knowing that people like Grandmaster Kaz, Melly Mel, Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc. Right. You know, um, Shy Rock, knowing that DJ Hollywood, right, knowing that they would be here to see it, the pioneers, the originators, you know, would be here to see it because you know we we've we, we've lost a lot of them. Exactly. You know, um, we've lost a lot of them. So the knowing that uh, some of the ones that were my heroes mm -hmm. that I looked looked up to. You know, they're still above ground and wow. They That's get beautiful. to, you know, really enjoy this. You get know. their flowers now. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that was one of the biggest things to me. You know. Wow. Yeah. I, I just knew they couldn't do fifty years of hip hop <laughs> without you being <laughs> a factor in that situation. Of the events that I was a part of, I was, you know, Happy to be there, and I hope that you know everybody enjoyed those. There were some that I was not a part of, but I still think that they came off successful and were, were great as well. Seeing the pioneers shine, I think that that was the most important thing wow, to me. Wow, I get it. You know, like had I had the power to really create one of those events, I would have did one where yeah, there would have been at least a good maybe eight minute tribute mm -hmm. to like the pioneers such as Cold Crush Brothers, Grandmaster Flash and the wow. Furious Five, mm -hmm. um, Treacherous Three, Funky Four plus one more. Right. You know, cause it's like, these are the ones that paved the way. Right. Before records went to wax. I mean, before rap went to wax. I, I get it. And then when it did, they had, you know, um, brief success in the early 80s, I, I feel like they don't get, they don't receive the accolades that they deserve for what they created and what they built, you know? And now to see where it is now, I would have loved to see something that really paid homage to them just a little bit more. I, I can totally understand you know, that, yeah. um, to be able to create something, give it life, and then watch it being taken somewhere and for it not to reach back and touch you, that that's got to be a hurting feeling. H how did your relationship with um, LL Cool J, Slick Rick, all of these, how, how did that journey take place? There are a lot of cats that I've met through the industry Mm -hmm. But there are very few that I became close friends mm -hmm. with. LL is someone that I became a close friend with. Okay. Me and Slick Rick, we hung out a lot. Yeah. Um, Eric B. Right. From Eric B and Rakim, that's someone that I became a close friend with. Cool G Rap. I would probably say I have the closest relationship 
to Dougie Fresh. We have one of those um, Barkley Jordan. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. You know, where I cuss his ass out. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, man. But I love him to death. Like, that's my, like, that's my heart, for real. I love I that brother, it. man. Something so unique is, like, when you look at artists, like LL Cool J, Slick Rick, Eric B. and Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, MC Light. Right. Definitely. Love you, sister. Rob Bass. Um, Queen Latifah. Yes. Nobody sounds alike. Every last one of those artists I just mentioned have completely different styles, completely different music. That originality, right. that's what I would love to see right now in hip hop, where everybody just bring their own unique style, their own unique music, their own unique conversation. Wow. Yeah. Let me hear you talk about something different. <laughs> you see what I'm different saying? Subjects. Man. In your language. I just saw a uh, Scarface. Here's a brother, you know, from Texas that brought his own style, right. his own flavor, his own story into hip hop. That was an East Coast controlled thing. And the East Coast respected it. The world respected it. Man. You know? They killed it. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, I think it's beautiful to, to hear the East Coast opinion of hip hop, of what they see in their hood. When the West Coast came, we're hearing what's happening in the West Coast in their hood, wow. you know, in Compton and, you know, these yeah, Long the Beach. South. All these, you know, when the South came, we're hearing a Southern perspective. You know, this is what was happening in their hood in the South. And then um, Eminem comes and tells you about his ghetto. <laughs> now you're wow. hearing about trailer parks. Do you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? Another game. You hear you hear about the white ghetto. Expression. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's I mean, it's it's it, I just think that, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And I think that when everybody's telling their own story, you see so much uniqueness, man. Wow. As opposed to just trendy stuff where everything is sounding the same. Exactly. Do you feel like hip-hop has, certain parts of hip-hop has been destructive in its own way to our communities? Oh. Yes, I feel that um, hip-hop has been destructive to our community in different ways. Sometimes the way a message is perceived, you know, um, it can be detrimental. Exactly. Now, do we point the finger only at the artists or or do we also point the finger at, you know, the music industry? The industry. Because we have an industry that's focused on a certain sound, a certain conversation, certain songs that they want to hear. Exactly. Because it's like you can be a conscious rapper talking mm. about growing up in the hood, you know, trying to, you know, get right. You know, you, you, can, you can do that and you'll be boxed in. Exactly. You want that, that radio play? <laughs> your song going to play in between Little Uzi Vert and Kodak Black? Here's our and agenda. This is what, yeah, exactly. Here's <laughs> the agenda. So I don't completely blame the artist because, you know, you, you taking a little kid from the ghetto trying to make some money to feed his family. And he, you know? he's not experienced. Yeah. You know, so yeah. now you're exploiting him yeah. to do certain things. The prison industry, mm -hmm. which is controlled or I can't say controlled, funded, invested in. The music industry has invested a lot in mm -hmm. the prison system. I'm aware of this. Yeah. And they control the narrative to our music. It seems to generate a certain action from our community to be able to fuel the prison system. Absolutely. The positive message of the late 80s was too powerful. Exactly. And scary. Exactly. And scary. It was I mean, conscious. It was, matter of fact, it was scary <laughs> when you saw a bunch of black kids 
take $5,000 gold chains off their neck wow. and put a leather medallion, a $10 leather medallion on Hello. because of what Public Enemy was talking about. Yes. That's when it was scary. Yes. It became terrifying when you went to a Public Enemy show <laughs> right. and saw a majority of the crowd was white kids. Wow. That's when it became terrifying. Yeah. That was a whole nother game. This has got to stop because now you're making our children aware mm -hmm. of a certain reality that we've been hiding. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I, I totally so get it. The agenda had to change. How do you see the difference between hip hop then when you started and evolved through it and hip hop now? Hip hop then would be young kids from the hood trying to be recognized as the dopest MC on their block, the best DJ on their block. Right. And somehow managed to finally get discovered. <laughs> and do Because that. of their talent. Right. Because of their talent. Raw talent. You know, and they finally got discovered because of that and they got a record deal. And they had the opportunity to tell their story because the record company owner, the A&R, all them, they didn't really have no idea exactly. about what they were doing. They were fresh <laughs> off of work in a, a Stephanie Mills or a Lilo Thomas right. record. They didn't really know too much about hip hop. Exactly. So we could do what we wanted to do, talk about what we wanted to talk about. Mm. You know, that was then. We're talking about artists coming from hip hop culture. Right. Today, we're talking mainly about artists coming from the hip hop genre. Okay. Because now hip hop is the biggest selling music genre. Mm -hmm. So hip hop is pop culture. And in right. pop culture, you know, you can wake up one day and say, I got an idea. Imagine if I made a song about a mouse, <laughs> you know, in yeah. pop culture, you can do that. Exactly. And it'd be a big major hit. Uh, you have a lot of people today that wake up and just say, I want to make a record. Wow. So it's not, they're not looking for the most skilled MC. They're not looking for the most talented MC. They're looking for someone that, you know, can make a hit record. And with that being said, there's nothing wrong with that. There's I nothing get wrong with that get because as soon as hip hop became a, a music genre, those are the rules. I get those it. Those are the rules because there's a lot of R and B artists that can't sing. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of um, country singers that can't sing. You know, they just had something good that the audience gravitated to. I get it. So I mean, you can't knock hip hop for doing the same thing. Do you feel that? Hip hop sold us out in a way, you know, and, and I'm going to go on. It's a two part question. Uh, I, I don't want to say did hip hop sell us out, but how was hip hop manipulated into being able to sell out our community? If oh, if you so. say us, you mean the community? Yes. Yes. I. I can believe that, you know, um, many different powers that be have used hip hop as a tool. Yes, I agree. To sell out um, the community. But I mean, I can't blame that on hip hop because right. you do have some amazing hip hop artists out there that are speaking against the system. Power to truth, you know, truth to power, should yeah. I say. I, I, I totally agree. Can you give some words of wisdom? Do we have some responsibility to the people? People that care probably feel that they have a responsibility. It's just a matter of connecting with them mm -hmm. and figuring out a safe way they can be involved. I get it. When I say safe, I mean, you know, there's been a whole lot of rich people whose wings have been clipped. I get it. By trying, by to, trying you know, to help. Yeah. And 
like like what 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 Jim Brown was trying to explain about um, Kaepernick. It, it, it's 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 going to be hard for you to be an activist and a football player. Wow. You, yeah. You're not going to be able to do them today at the same time. Yeah. You know, you might want to wait until yeah. after. Because it's like, you know, as long as you're seeking that career, there's always a wits. There's something there that they can use to hold you down, to exactly. restrict you. What, what do you think about when it comes to 400 years of slavery here in America and there's been no compensation for the demise of our human rights as a people here. Do you feel like reparations could be awarded to us without it being a negative connotation, whereas we could work with the government in rebuilding ourselves without them feeling threatened? Without them feeling threatened? Yes. <laughs> you you know, get I it? Mean, I mean, I feel there's a way that we could work, where, you know, where we could work towards it, but without them feeling threatened, hell no. Hell no. Wow. Nah. That's going to be a, a, a hard pill to swallow and a hell of a road to hope. You know, you have to look at what's been happening in the world. Laws created to protect um, gender hate, um... Asian hate, uh, cruelty to animals. Mm -hmm. But feel free to hate us. We got Juneteenth. (laughs) Crazy is all outdoors. Yeah. I I feel like there's a way to deal with that, but we'll we'll come back to that. So with that being said, uh, for those out there, young people, that are trying to get into the industry and pursue a career, can you leave them some wisdom on things they should watch out for and things they should be prepared for? Well, I would tell you that if you're trying to get into the music business, one of the first things you got to understand is those are two words. So as much as you're concerned about your music, mm. be equally concerned about your business. Wow. And if you want to have longevity and stay power, do not follow nothing that's trendy. Because mm-hmm. when that trend is gone, you're gone. Wow. You have to make people embrace you for your originality, that uniqueness that you have. Make people want to have the same hairstyle as you, wear wow. the same clothes as you, whatever type of sunglasses or or prescription glasses that you wear. They want to have that. You know, they want to wear the type of jewelry you wear. That's that's the type of thing that creates um, that type of stay power. When you show people your uniqueness, they're embracing what you're about, what you stand for, what you believe in. And most importantly, I, I would say that, you know, you got to really, really believe in yourself and put 100% to it, you know, because I mean, if you don't have motivation, Dedication and determination, <laughs> you just go end up it. working for another motherfucker that does. Wow. Hey, take that with you. You know, I, I want to say thank you to my brother. You know what I'm saying? OG Big Daddy Kane, a living legend. Hey, again, like they say, you know, give brother his flowers now because he's a very intricate part of our history. That's it. That's all. We have created this show so that men and women alike can come forward and tell their truth. If you have people that you believe to be an OG, go into the comment section, write us, let us know where to find the history so that we can authenticate it, bring them on the show, tell their story so that we can add to the American history. That's it. That's all. The original OG.